Hi everyone. I hope this finds you all very well. This is the first narrated lecture for Bio 160 uh, that I'll be doing throughout the semester. This is a lecture on predation and herbivory. To start things off, um, let me just mention that uh, for this and all the other narrated lectures to come, uh, please uh, post any questions you have on Canvas uh, through a discussion. So just start a discussion. I'll be um, monitoring those questions and answering them. And that way everybody has a chance to um, read the question, also read the answers and so forth. Okay, so let's get started. First of all, uh, the learning objectives. I just want to point those out. Uh, the first is to demonstrate how predators and herbivores can limit the size of populations. That w that's what we'll talk about first. And then uh, we'll go over how predation and herbivory favor the evolution of defenses. So most every species consumes resources and of course are also a resource for other species. This cartoon image of the Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote may be familiar to you. Uh, although it's clearly not realistic, it does convey this concept, um, but also the idea of a back and forth capture and avoid capture uh, relationship between, in this case, a predator and its prey. On the one hand, of course, the roadrunner is ever trying and of course somehow always seems to succeed in outsmarting the coyote. On the other, the coyote goes to ever more elaborate means of trying to capture the elusive roadrunner. Uh, and of course, the poor creature never seems to succeed. In their efforts to capture prey, predators exert strong selective pressure on their prey to avoid being captured. This also holds true, of course, for herbivores, which exert selective pressure on the plants they consume. That is, any adaptation of the prey or plant that allows it to avoid or minimize being consumed is obviously beneficial and will likely increase its fitness. By the same token, adaptations that increase the chances of the predator capturing the prey or herbivore consuming the predator will increase its fitness. So natural selection in this context functions to produce more effective predators and herbivores and prey and plants that can avoid or minimize uh, consumption. As prey and plants evolve characteristics to avoid or reduce consumption by predators and herbivores, they themselves evolve more effective means of consuming them. This is called, um, or it's sometimes been called, an evolutionary arms race, uh, but uh, technically and in biological terms, this reciprocal evolutionary dynamic is correctly called coevolution. Today we'll start by exploring how predators and herbivores can exert pressure on prey population abundance, and then we'll turn to some interesting adaptations that prey and plants have evolved that allow them to avoid or reduce consumption. Predation involves the consumption of one living organism, the prey, by another, the predator. This excludes scavengers and decomposers because they eat non-living tissue. Ergon herbivores also consume living organisms, that is plants, but normally don't kill them. I say normally because seed predators consume the entire individual in the form of a seed and planktivores consume entire plankton. The classic example of predation, of course, is one animal killing and eating another. In other words, a predator is a carnivore. When considering which kind of animal is eaten, ecologists break down predators into two broad categories. Small carnivores that eat herbivores are called mesopredators, while top predators are those that consume mesopredators and herbivores. The term top for top predators refers to the fact that those predators are at the top of the trophic food web, meaning no other predator eats them. Herbivores consume living tissue as well. However, they only consume part of the living plant, not all. Although herbivores harm the plant, 
they don't usually kill it. An exception, uh, as I pointed out earlier, are seed predators and planktivores. Parasites are a special case that uh, we won't cover here, but like herbivores, parasites feed on the prey, the host that is, while they're still alive, but don't normally kill their host outright. Let's take a look at how predators um, can influence the abundance of prey populations. There was a classic study by um, Shaner and Spiller that examined the role of lizard predators on spider populations. First, they um, on these um, on on a set of islands, they they surveyed uh, 93 islands in the Bahamas, ranging. The islands range from about 200 to 4,000 square um, meters in size, so they weren't huge islands, but they did have quite a broad range in size of the islands they, they surveyed. And they found that spider populations were about 10 times more abundant on islands that didn't have lizards compares, compared to those that did. Interestingly, only large islands had both spiders and lizards whereas small islands only had spiders. So here actually is a thought question. Why do you think lizards were only found on large islands? Think about this a little bit. I'm going to post it as a discussion question on Canvas. And um, a little hint uh, to think about. Think about the factors that we discussed that affect the colonization and extinction uh, for a meta population. Okay, so moving on to to test um, to experimentally test whether lizards were responsible for the lower spider populations. Shaner and Spiller introduced a total of twenty spiders uh, in two different introductions to each of ten small islands. On half the islands, predatory lizards were present. And on the other half, no lizards were present. This first graph shows that the proportion of spiders surviving was significantly lower on islands with lizards compared to islands without lizards, whether the islands were large or small. Over the course of five years of monitoring, um, they were monitoring the island spider populations, spiders remained rare or absent on islands with lizards, but increased 10 times on islands without lizards. Uh, it's important to note, uh, again, that the spiders were introduced on two different dates, and those are indicated by the arrows at the bottom of the graph. Not surprisingly, this has been observed across a wide range of prey in response to predation, and indicates that predators can um, truly have a market impact on populations of their prey. In 1839, um, and this is another, uh, this is an example actually of um, control of a plant population by an insect herbivore. In 1839, the prickly pear cactus, Apuntia, was imported into Australia for the use as primarily an agricultural fence, uh, and, but also in an attempt to ad establish an early um, carmine dye industry. The cactus population, uh, after it was introduced, quickly got out of control and um, essentially rendered approximately 12 and a half million hectares of arable land non-productive. The cactus moth, which was originally from South America, was introduced to Australia in 1926. Uh, this introduction was uh, an attempt to control the prickly pear cactus population because the larvae uh, of the cactus moth feeds on the growing shoots of the cactus plant, the apuntia. The damage allows the parasite to kill the cactus. So after this introduction by 1930, and that um, is shown in the picture at the right, so the picture before was um, before they introduced the cactus moth, and the picture on the right is after they did. Um, 
1930, all the original Aplintia stands were decimated. And by 1940, the Cactoblastis moth had brought the cactus population um, virtually under complete control. Today, actually, both the Aplintia cactus and the Cactoblastis moth coexist with one another, turns out, with the Aplintia um, cactus surviving in refuges where the Cactoblastis moth hasn't found it yet. But once a Cactoblastis moth arrives at a patch with the Apuntia plant, it will qu quickly decimate that patch, uh, that patch of, of cactus. So there's a, a complex dynamic of um, the Apuntia establishing, Cactoblastis moth arriving and decimating it, and um, so it's in this complex dynamic they, that they will coexist. Um, the cacti, um, the Apuntia that is, uh, today is uh, present but in relatively small um, patch sizes because once the patches get large enough, the Cactoblastis moth finds them and then decimates them. Well, this was such a success um, in Australia, uh, Australia, the introduction of the Cactoblastis moth, that they were introduced from there in 1933 to South Africa, which had a similarly severe Apuntia population, and then in Hawaii in 1950, um, where Apuntia was also introduced. Later, they were introduced into other, um, other locations um, in South Africa, Caribbean and so forth. And the same kind of dynamic has persisted between the Apuntia and the Cactoblastis moth. Herbivory can also have a very significant impact on where you can find certain native plants. So this is an example of a, of a plant um, called Haplopappus squarosus which occurs from coastal to interior regions. And uh, this plant uh, is strongly affected by an herbivorous insect that really strongly affects its distribution uh, between those maritime or coastal location and the interior locations. Svata Lauda uh, conducted an experiment in which she restricted herbivory on individuals of the Haplopappus species by applying an insecticide and then monitoring the abundance um, of the plant, flower development, and fruit ripening across a range of locations from the coastal areas, from a you know, right adjacent to the, the ocean in a maritime location through the coastal and um, into interior locations. So this is shown in that graph there on, on the left. The dotted line is um, the expected distribution that would occur without herbivory. And, um, and they know that because uh, this is when herbivory was restricted, this, the Haplopappus was actually able to grow in these local, um, these maritime locations as well as interior locations. But when the insect herbivory was allowed to occur, uh, Haplopappus's observed distribution changed dramatically, and that's shown in those green bars. Lauda also quantified the amount of herbivory across this gradient. Sorry, a little slow to um, click. So you can see where herbivory was um, restricted in the expected distribution, and then where herbivory was allowed uh, is shown in the observed distribution. Lauda also quantified the amount of herbivory across this gradient by um, quantifying the percent of uh, flowering heads that were destroyed by the insect. So you can see in the picture that they the, the Haplopappus produces these um, yellow flowering heads, those are actually, this plant is actually in the sunflower family and it produces kind of like um, little dandelion types of, of flowers with many flowers in them. And so Lauda was able to 
count the number of these flowering heads that were destroyed by the insect. And the results in the graph at the bottom right show that the insect herbivory was highest near the coast. So this corresponded with where the, there was the greatest decline in the numbers of individuals. And of course, it fundamentally affected its, the plant's distribution. Of course, um, we probably ought to just kind of think back on our discussion of the niche uh, thought question here. Which, which is the plant's fundamental and which is its realized niche? Is the expected the fundamental or realized? Is the observed fundamental realized? Well, of course, as we've discussed, the expected distribution would be the distribution that uh, would occur without an interaction with this herbivore species. And so therefore, that would be its fundamental niche. And the observed distribution with herbivory would be its realized niche. So prey have um, so shifting now to uh, looking at prey themselves, so both prey in the form of animal prey, but also plants um, being consumed, prey have evolved quite a wide range of adaptations to, to avoid predation. So uh, these include cryptic and warning colorations, um, mimicry, biomimicry, various behaviors, um, structural defenses in plants as chemical defenses and so forth. So let's take a look at these because um, they're really quite fascinating. So some prey have evolved to blend into their surroundings. Uh, this is called cryptic coloration and the picture that I just put up there actually has an organism in it it's cryptically colored. Can you make the organism out? Well, if you look closely, uh, there's a leaf and you can see kind of the vein of the leaf going from the upper right to the lower left of the, um, the image. And then right next to it is a frog, turns out. This is a Madagascar frog. You can see, um, perhaps if you look closely, you can see its snout nestled up against the leaf um, and its eyes on either side, its forelimbs there, uh, one of them is touching the leaf. So this, this frog uh, blends in really quite well with its surroundings because of its cryptic coloration. Another example of this, of course, is a stick insect. You've, some of you may, as a kid, have had a pet stick, in, stick insect. My, my son did, in fact, for a little while. I mean, it was short-lived, but he, he was kind of into that for a while, and we had some stick insects in the house, so that was kind of fun. Um, but these uh, organisms also, uh, both in terms of their coloration, but also shape, will blend into the background of the vegetation and be um, less visible to potential predators. We call this um, crypsis, uh, sometimes crypticity or cryptic coloration. Other species have evolved uh, coloration patterns as well, but in this case it's not to blend into the background, but it actually is to stand out as a warning. Um, and uh, so warning coloration can also be a very effective means of avoiding predation or reducing it. And this warning, or sometimes called aposematic coloration, signals predators of danger. An interesting example of this is that uh, some prey organisms defend themselves this way uh, from predators by mimicking the coloration of harmful ones. A striking example of this is the poisonous coral snake and the harmless king snake. So you can see um, on the right is the harmful coral snake and on the left the harmless king snake. These two species actually co-occur in much of their range. Of course that would be 
necessary if, if that um, coloration pattern is going to work in the way that I'll describe. So the king snake, uh, the coloration of the king snake actually mimics the light, dark, panding, alternating banding pattern of the coral snake as a means of warding off predators because the coral snake is toxic. And if the king snake appears to a predator to potentially be the poisonous coral snake, that predator will avoid it. The kinds of predators uh, that would would tend to um, cue in on these different snakes would be so hawks, for example, bobcats, even bears. Um, and, and they'll avoid the king snake as much as they would a coral snake because they believe it's poisonous. To distinguish, actually there's a saying to, to distinguish the poisonous from the non-poisonous, there's an old saying that goes something like this. If, if red touches yellow, you're a dead fellow. If red touches black, you're all right, Jack. So that's a, a, a saying that um, will help you remember which one is poisonous and which one is not. This is actually called um, Batesian mimicry. And there I just put on the harmless and toxic uh, for those. So this is called Batesian mimicry. And again, that's where uh, prey will uh, defend themselves against predators by making themselves look like another species that actually is harmful. Another in example is in the um, uh, uh, among butterflies, and this example is uh, with the toxic pipe vine swallowtail and the harmless eastern tiger swallowtail. So on the right is the pipe vine swallowtail, and this is a toxic species that produces a it, it carries a toxin in it, um, and the eastern tiger swallowtail actually shares some similar kinds of coloration patterns. Not identical, but similar enough to where predators, when they see it, um, will tend to avoid it because they think it may be um, the, the toxic form of the pipe vine swallowtail. So again, these, these um, these species of butterfly overlap in their range. And so, uh, again, of course, this would be necessary if that um, adopting that coloration pattern were to be effective. So, again, the harmless eastern swallowtail on the left and the toxic pipe vine on the right. Uh, there's another type of mimicry as well that evolution has cooked up, so to speak, uh, when different species, all of which are distasteful or harmful, share a single pattern of warning coloration. This can also be an effective means of warding off predators. By sharing the same pattern of warning coloration, um, the visual cue of being distasteful or harmful will be reinforced by many different species sharing the same kind of coloration pattern. A great example of this is in the group of colorful tropical and subtropical butterflies in the genus Heliconius. This is a pretty big genus. There's lots of different species. And the species in this genus are usually um, highly distasteful to predators. Because they all resemble one another in their coloration patterns, the predators tend to avoid them. And you can sort of see that for a lot of them, they have this yellow stripe, um, alternating kind of dark light, um, yellow striping going on, on on parts of their wing tips and things like that. Uh, so when a predator, um, oftentimes, say a predatory bird, uh, sees a heliconius butterfly, it will tend to avoid them because they all somewhat resemble one another in their coloration pattern. So that reinforces their avoidance of them. A similar phenomenon occurs in certain species of wasps and flies, all, um, all being harmful and all sharing the same dark light, kind of alternating dark light banded pattern. This is referred to as Mullerian mimicry. And um, again, it's a single pattern of warning coloration um, that is shared by um, 
individual species, all of which are harmful or perhaps distasteful. Interestingly, Heliconius butterflies, as well as others, such as the monarch butterfly, don't actually produce their own toxins. So this is where things get really interesting. They actually store them um, from plants that they consume as larvae. In other words, when they're caterpillars, so they consume the toxin and store it um, through adulthood. So monarchs are known for doing this. So let's take a, a closer look because this is actually pretty fascinating. Um, this is a, a really interesting interaction that occurs between plants, a, an, an, a, a butterfly that in the form of its larva, the caterpillar is an herbivore, and then um, the, the predators on the adult butterfly. Some plants actually synthesize chemical compounds. These are secondary compounds. In this case, um, it's a cardenolide toxin, and this is a type of steroid uh, that is toxic. And at pretty high doses, at high doses that can be actually heart arresting to some animals, including birds who prey on the monarch. The plant that the monarch eats in this case is, a, is called milkweed. So the, the monarch larvae feed on milkweed, which itself produces the car cardenolide toxin, and then the monarchs accumulate that compound and store it into adulthood, making them toxic to many vertebrate predators. Studies have actually shown that certain animals exhibit signs of toxicity after coming into contact with, with monarchs, and so this was one of the early observations that led scientists to believe that um, something interesting was, was going on. One susceptible species is the blue jay. Let me catch up here. Sorry, I'm getting a little behind with my slide and advancing these slides. Um, so on the left up there is the larvae feeding on a milkweed, which has the cardenolide toxin, and then it accumulates in the monarch into its adulthood. So as I mentioned, one of the susceptible bird species is the blue jay, and um, in, s in various studies, uh, captive blue jays have been uh, found to be susceptible to these ca uh, cardenolide toxins. In fact, blue jays that were fed on monarchs containing the cardenolide toxins became sick and exhibited increased um, vomiting after eating the monarchs. In fact, uh, here, so here's a fun little fact, actually. The, the chances in the study, actually, the, the chances of, of vomiting was proportional to the cardenolide toxin in the monarch butterfly. So they actually were able to correlate the um, how much vomiting occurred in, in the poor birds as they eat the, ate the monarchs uh, and related that to uh, the concentration in the monarch. So the higher the concentration, the higher the frequency of vomiting in, in the blue jays. So it's also been demonstrated that wild monarch butterflies consisting of or containing high levels of cardenolide um, toxins are actually less susceptible to predation by not only birds, but also by mites. So this is a strategy that uh, seems to be quite effective in, a, in the monarch reducing predation. Plants have also evolved a wide range of structural and chemical defenses against herbivory. We were just talking about the example of the milkweed plant that produced the cardenolide toxin. So this is, this is just one example. But let's start with structural defenses. So plants produce quite a wide range of structural defenses. These include thorns, hairs, tough seed coats, sticky gums, resins, and so forth. Thorns, of course, for large mammalian herbivores are quite an effective means of, of reducing, um, minimizing herbivory. But also smaller hairs, uh, although we might not notice them, they can be very effective deterrents for small insect herbivores like aphids, for example, that um, 
are trying to reach the surface of the plant tissues in order to insert a proboscis into the, say, the, xy uh, the, the phloem to, to access, uh, you know, the sugary sap of plants. Or sticky resins that, um, or gums that, that can also protect like seed heads, uh, flowering seeds, he seed heads, where the seeds, the flower um, has been um, pollinated fertilized, the seeds are developing but haven't ripened yet, many plants produce um, protective structures or sticky gums to protect those seeds. Of course, those are, the, those are their offspring, and, um, and they put a lot of energy into protecting those from seed predators, for example. Pine trees, that um, a lot of pine trees are susceptible to um, bark beetles, for example. And um, when a bark beetle bores into the bark of, of a pine tree, it will produce um, the resins that are produced by the pine trees will seep into that, that opening and clog it up. And that will prevent the beetle from penetrating further into the plant. So these different resins and so forth can also be very effective um, structural deterrents for, for herbivores. And of course, plants produce quite a wide range of chemical compounds that are uh, compounds that will either um, prevent or minimize damage to plants because of their toxic nature or sometimes just their distastefulness. A few examples. Um, well, we just talked about the, the milkweed and its production of cardenolide toxin. But a large variety of plants produce secondary compounds, some of which we actually consume ourselves. If you think about all the, the different kinds of um, herbs that, that we use in cooking, all of those different flavors that, that we recognize. So for example, mint, or uh, for example, uh, like basil, or thyme, or oregano. These, these are all plants that we use in, in cooking because they impart a certain kind of flavor to the foods that, that we're, we're making. But those chemical compounds are actually produced by the plant as um, secondary compounds that are anti-herbivore defense compounds. There's also um, the notion that, at least chemically, plants produce uh, fairly dilute kind of tissues that don't have very high concentrations of nutrients. And so for from the standpoint of herb herbivores, uh, they're, they're the quality of the forage, that is the, 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 the nutrients in the plant tissue is, is rather low. So that can also um, deter herbivores from um, consuming plant material as opposed to other sources of nutrients. And lastly, plants are just simply pretty tolerant to being eaten in the first place. Plants are very modular. When tissues are, are damaged or consumed, they'll, uh, they'll be able to regrow um, uh, rather, rather, um, rather quickly. And so plants just simply have a pretty high tolerance to, to being consumed. Uh, to wrap things up, one of the questions that arises, of course, if plants are producing, um, you know, defenses, maybe those defenses are structural, maybe they are chemical, is there a fitness cost to producing those defenses? There's certainly, as, as I, I think we've discussed before, there's this notion of a, the principle of allocation. There's only so much energy that a plant or any other organism for that matter has to allocate to different processes or functions like growth, reproduction, and so forth. If plants are producing these um, defenses in the form of structural or, or chemical defenses, uh, does that actually have a cost on their fitness? Or in this case, of course, fitness referring to reproduction. This idea was tested um, 
in, in tobacco where the researchers actually um, wanted to find out whether or not uh, tobacco would, um, if it was damaged, whether that um, upregulation of defense compounds in the tobacco would actually have a fitness cost. So Baldwin and others, uh, they studied this and what they did was they took advantage of a hormone called auxin, which actually reduces the plant's normal defense response to pestis. So here's, here's what they did. In this graph on the lower left, they first wanted to establish that applying auxin would actually reduce the plant's normal defense response as measured by the production of certain alkaloid compounds in the plants that uh, the tobacco that were these defensive compounds. So what you'll see is that in um, at the bottom there, you'll see undamaged plants, both the treatments and controls, and the damaged plants where the auxin was applied, both have very low levels of defense production. But in the plants that were damaged, that were the controls, so those, are the, those are the lanolin controls, and lanolin is just a kind of a, a material that was a vehicle that they used for the auxin to apply it to the plants. They applied the lanolin without the auxin. Uh, they were able to show that when the plants were damaged, that they did have an increased um, defense response in the production of these alkaloid chemicals. So this, this was basically the way that they established that applying auxin would actually reduce the defense response. And they needed to do that because that was going to be the treatment in this next graph where what is shown is uh, the, the plants that were damaged and undamaged. So they had these two different um, uh, conditions where they had a set of plants that were damaged and another set that were undamaged. And to each of those, they either uh, applied the auxin treatment or the lanolin control. Again, the lanolin was, was the vehicle that they used to apply the auxin, but in the case of the lanolin control, they took the auxin out, okay? So I think if, if you look at these graphs closely, what you'll see is that the damaged plants treated with auxin produced more seed, okay? And they had a greater life, lifetime seed production. So in the oxen treated plants, these were the plants that um, had reduced production of defenses. They actually produced more seed. And the conclusion of the researchers in this case was that the, when plants didn't produce these defense compounds, they had more energy to put into reproduction. So this indicated that indeed there was a fitness cost to the production of these defenses. All right, that concludes the lecture on predation and herbivory. Again, please post any questions that you have about this lecture or any of the content in the readings or in the study questions on Canvas through a discussion, and I will be monitoring the, that daily, and I will answer those questions as they come up. All right, thanks.